This episode of the Real Rescue Podcast is brought to you by SR3 Rescue Concepts because you don't know what you don't know. Life Saving Systems Corporation. We do our work so you can do yours. Tough gear for tough jobs. Breeze Eastern, the world's only dedicated helicopter hoist and winch provider. Have you taken a minute to reach out to Dave and Jason at SR3? Or what about Mario over at LSC? Or maybe Jimmy at Breeze Eastern? They're not only sponsoring this podcast, these guys are actually friends of mine. So if you have not reached out to them, now is the time. Heck, even call them just to get a t-shirt or a hat, sport their logo, and wear it proud. SR3 Rescue Concepts is a training company that can help you with your helicopter training, a standardization check, a safety check, or maybe just an audit or an annual FAA refresher. They are ready to bring your agency up to date with the current techniques, rules, regulations, and equipment. The training staff is awesome. With certified flight instructor pilots and experienced crew members, which I am happy to say that I am a part of, they offer training in rescue, medical, tactical, firefighting, ground operation, and night vision goggle use. SR3 has partnered with Petzl to assist with the personal protective equipment inspection course and the highly specific Lazard, which is used in helicopter, cliff, and mountain rescue, or like our guys over in Norway, who think outside the box, and they used it on a vessel that was pitching and rolling. SR3 Rescue Concepts goes beyond the helicopter world too. They also provide high angle rescue training and tactical medicine training. Contact them today at sr3rescueconcepts.com and follow them over on Instagram at sr3 underscore rescue. Then we have Life Saving Systems Corporation. They manufacture the world's toughest helicopter rescue gear. From my favorite harness as a rescueman, the Triton harness, to the rescue baskets and the litters, and of course the most popular hoist in all of helicopters, the D-Lock. The team at LSC cuts, bends, sews, welds, and machines these products into existence every day. As they like to say, we do our work so you can do yours. Tough gear for tough jobs. Check them out today at lifesavingsystems.com and follow them on Instagram at rescue gear at R-E-S-Q-G-E-A-R. And we have Breeze Eastern. Since the very first helicopter rescue in November 1945, Breeze Eastern has designed and manufactured superior rescue hoist solutions. While much of the technology and unique mission requirements have changed over the past 75 years, their commitment to us, the rescuers, and the operators, and those rescued, has not. Contact Breeze Eastern today by visiting them at breeze-eastern.com. That's breeze-eastern.com. It's always fun for me to sit down and talk to instructors from A school. They give me their perspective, and I remember them in just such a different way from you know everybody else in the rate. But it's so fun for me to talk to these guys and hear about their rescues and how it impacted us in the school as far as what we learned and how they trained us. So please welcome our next guest, United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer number 66, Mr. Mike O'Dell. My name is Jason Quinn. I am United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer number 500. These are my rescues and rescues from those of us that put our lives on the line every day so others may live. This is The Real Rescue Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Real Rescue Podcast. Today, I have another one of my instructors from A School. I am so pumped to have him with me. United States Coast Guard rescue swimmer number 66, Mr. Mike O'Dell. How are you, Mr. Mike? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm doing great, Jason. Thanks. Thanks. That was, a, that was an awesome introduction. I think oh. it might be the best one I ever had. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome. It's much deserved. Okay. That's, that's what I'll throw in that one. <laughs> All right. All right. Nice. Yeah. Well, hey, happy to be, happy to be with you this morning. Dude. Awesome. I'm psyched to have you here. I really am. Um, to give everybody a little bit of a backstory about you and I, is it? So when I went to a school rescue swimmer, a school, uh, or AST, a school, 
you were my third phase instructor. And, you know, for the third phase, we did six weeks. That was where parachute stuff. So it was you and Al Yates and you guys, it was like, it was game on when we got to third phase and you guys made it a point to, to really put the hurting on us. And I, I loved every minute of it. It was so fun. So it was good. It was really good. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, you're welcome. It's a, uh, I've said before, uh, when when people have asked me about school you know I, I guys would leave school and go talk to their 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 shop mates and say you know i had this this instructor that was real real an asshole real real badass or real hard ass or whatever and and you say my name and everybody's like mike odell he's the goofiest guy i know what do you mean he was a hard ass <laughs> uh, and so a lot of that was is was all for effect uh i, I make up you know but uh one of the things about that kind of environment for that long, and I taught for five years, you get to the point where it feels like it's no longer an act, like it's uh, like you're really starting to get like angry man. And that was hard for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, there are a couple of things that I remember specifically. One of the drills that we had done, and uh, I'm not even sure if I can actually talk about this, but I'm going to anyway, is you, when we would do clearing, like for parachute cords, you know, you get, you go underwater and you put your head up in basically somebody's butt area, like right up into the, you know, into the hamstring area. Right. And you're yeah. clearing one leg at a time to make sure all, all lines and, and everything is off the, you know, off the person, off your victim. And one of the, I don't know what happened. We ended up popping, you know, you're telling us, Hey, keep doing this. You're not staying under long enough. And finally you had had enough of telling us and you're like, that's it. You guys are doing 25 meters down underwater pushing somebody clearing if you pop you're doing like a thousand and i was like oh game on <laughs> it was awesome gosh well awesome. yeah if you don't if you don't have the if, if you don't have the time or the stamina to do it right the first time how are you going to have the time and stamina to do it the third and fourth and fifth time because you can't stay down and that is why school is so important Man, ah, I, yeah. I really had a good time with you guys. You know, as, as much as school was the hardest thing that I've ever done, I really had, it's one of my best memories too. So it's awesome. Cool. Yeah. Right on. Well, if you don't mind, uh, cause I know we had this, but if you could introduce yourself to everybody out there and then kind of give a brief rundown as like how you joined the Coast Guard and how you got into being a swimmer, that would be awesome. Well, <clears throat> like you said, my name is Mike, Mike Odell. Uh, uh, I got into the Coast Guard almost by accident. I had I had was on my way to joining the Air Force. I was only 18, uh, had just moved from Lake Tahoe area down to Monterey and was planning on uh, being a cop, I think, is if I remember right. And I was going to go to school and learn to be a law enforcement officer. And uh, I was delayed doing that. And so I started thinking about what I wanted to do else. And I came across this ad for about, about Air Force. And so I I uh, went through the process to join the Air Force and took the ASVAB through them and did MEPS through them. And I uh, was just uh, weeks away from signing the papers and heading off to Air Force basic training and uh, saw an ad in the, for the Coast Guard. And I really didn't know much about the Coast Guard. I'd seen, you know, the little small, small white boats cruising around the bay and seen some of the helicopters, but I didn't, I didn't really know much about it. But I, well, I imagine that they were like the lifeguards of the sea. And I had been a lifeguard in high school and I had uh, learned, uh, I'd, I'd been part of a group here in the Sierras called um, uh, Young Adult Search and Rescue. And so I'd learned something about search and rescue. I'd learned some stuff about basic first aid and I'd been a lifeguard and it seemed like a perfect fit. Uh, and so I called the recruiter and long story short, within about a month, I was headed to basic training. The Air Force recruiter had to give over all his hard work to the Coast Guard recruiter who had almost nothing to do and sent me <laughs> off the sent me off nice. the basic training in the Coast Guard. So I kind of jumped ship right there in the very end uh, and was was never obviously never looked back and never regretted it. Um, um, I spent uh, my first tour in Astoria, Oregon as a non rate. And while I was there, uh, a swimmer, you may recognize his, his name, Kelly Gordon, uh, oh, was yes. stationed there stationed there as a third-class petty officer in the ASM shop. This was before the swimmer program. But that fir first year I was in the Coast Guard, uh, the swimmer program came about uh, in, 90, 80, in 1985. And he went off with the first five uh, to get the rescue swimmer training. 
And I was just blown away by the idea of it. And I remember him coming back from that training. Remember, I, I'm not sure. I think he's number, I don't know. I can't remember which number he is in that, that first five, but he was the first five. And he was just a hero to me. And he comes back and, and we're standing around the hangar deck and everybody's shaking his hand and they all, all want to know what it was like. And there's like a hundred guys around him. And, wow. and just, uh, just, just mesmerized by these stories he's telling about what he went through and going through the school. And I, I, I decided right there, that's what I wanted to do. My name was already on the ASM list as well as the Corman list and the ET list. Uh, and I took my name off of both the other lists and just put my name on the swimmer, the ASM, ASM list. And within a year, because they were plussing up so quickly because they needed to get guys into the field. Uh, anybody that put their name on the list was going really, really fast. I make up. It's not that way. Now I think the wait for ASM AST schools a bit longer, but for us, once you had your name on that list, because they needed to take stations that only had two or three ASMs and they needed a, a duty standing list. And so a lot of us got in really, really fast. And so within a year I was off to swimmer school, ASM yeah, school. That is awesome. Now you went to, uh, let's see. You went to North Carolina for training and then went down to Pensacola. So you went through, you were one of the first couple of guys. Well, my first couple of guys, the first generation that went to Pensacola to get the rescue swimmer side of the training. Yeah, they were, they were still trying to piece together how best to do it. As I make up, they still are. I understand they're still coming and trying to, to build a system that, that works and graduates more applicants uh, because attrition rate, as I'm sure you know, has always been um, high. Yeah. And that's not good. That's not good for business. And so they've always tried to figure out the best way to do it to get the most people through. And for from that point all the way through when I was teaching, it was pretty solid right around only about 30, 30 percent of the people were making it through. And so my class, they kept trying different stuff. My class, they decided not to do anything with us at all when we were in Elizabeth City. Um, I think they gave us one PT test in the three or four months I was there. And everything else was up to us to go to the gym, to run, to do push-ups. Everything was completely on us. And they were going to just send us out completely untrained down to Pensacola and see how we did. And, <laughs> oh, and man. I, and I don't want to out us too much, but uh, most of us just spent most of our time at the beach. Uh, every, every weekday, every weekend, when school was out, we headed to the beach. And that was kind of our workout routine i remember maybe running once or twice i hardly did any spend any time in the gym we just just had a great time and became a really close group and i do not at all discount the value in us being really great friends when we went down to pensacola because uh for me it, it made all the difference in the world when you were on the grinder and it felt like the world was falling in on your head to look over and have one of your guys that you'd spent the summer at the beach with to kind of wink at you or to give you, you know, stick his tongue out like, ah, this is crazy. It just, <laughs> it, That's it, awesome. it just, it just took the load off. Yeah. And I think a lot of, a lot of this type of job is about keeping your head cool and not letting the weight get to you and just, uh, just going with the flow. And that's what it felt like in swimmer school for me. I turned 21 in Pensacola during rescue swimmer school. So it was a memorable summer for me. <laughs> that is so fun. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And our attrition rate, I think, I think we, uh, we, we graduated, uh, on time eight out of 12. And oh, then that's the other, good. We, we, I think we only lost one. Uh, her name was Marilyn Wagner. She was a female that was in our class. And I think she's the only one that never made it through. Everybody else kind of got washed back. We had two or three that washed back, uh, and made it out a few weeks later. But I think, I think that the, the program of doing nothing at all with us and let us, let us just hang out, at least work for our class. Cause most of us, we graduated, man. That's, that's yeah. pretty cool. Well, I, I know yeah. it's a lot different now and it was a lot different when I went through school with you too, just because of the, everything, all the lessons that have been learned had, had grown and is still growing to what it is now. It's amazing. So, yeah. And for you, you had the benefit of us kind of weeding out all the, the stuff that didn't really apply to us in the Coast Guard, the, the way we do rescues in the Coast Guard, as you might imagine, in the civilian sector is a whole lot different than preparing Navy guys to pull their own out of the water if they crash their, their helicopters, or their airplanes in the water. And so it was nice to, to weed out the stuff that didn't matter and to add the stuff that did uh, 
for for civilian rescue, r- pulling people out of the water that had no idea what to expect. Right, right. Yeah, it was it yeah. was great. That's so fun. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. All right. So now, um, after you graduated, you went to your first unit, which was where? Because I, I, the reason I'm asking this is because um, I know at that point in time, again, you being rescue swimmer number 66, it, all, not all the units had uh, swimmers yet. So that was still being brought up and, and built up. Yeah. I, my first unit was Elizabeth City. So I really just had to go across the, the parking lot, really, over to the air station. Nice. Um, and it was interesting being at that that phase of the development of the swim program because I mentioned Kelly Gordon and him being part of the first five and how I knew him in Astoria as a non-rate. When I got to the shop in Elizabeth City, he was there. And he was there with Steve Ober, who was also one of the top, uh, the first five. And Butch Flythe, who is yep. uh, obviously in, infamous slash famous in the swimmer rate. Yes, he is. And, and and Rick Wolford, who is one of the first five, was upstairs at the uh, at the stand team with Larry Farmer uh, at the time. And so we, I was my first unit had, well, counting Rick upstairs, I had four of the top five, and Matt Fithian, who was the other, but he had just left, and so I was thrown into the wolf's den with the top first five swimmers ever in the Coast Guard, and uh, it was a hoot those guys oh, uh, that's awesome it, yeah it was really awesome to be amongst uh swimmer royalty oh you know it i don't know that we knew it at the time because we you know we didn't know what it would become but obviously those guys have been staples in the swimmer conversation uh, mm-hmm. over the years and to, to have spent my first tour with with those guys was was really something and i've got i got great memories and and i still have feel uh, friendship with with most of those guys well, all of them all of them for sure they're all yeah. my friends on facebook if that counts yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know like it's actually kind of cool because you know we do have a couple you know tight facebook group you know for us and uh it's it's all of us just swimmers and 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 it's how we're all keeping in track it's it's such a brotherhood no matter whether you're number one or 1001 everybody reached you know was watching out for each other it's pretty awesome so the fact that you guys have like absolutely. paid that way it's, is just amazing. Yeah, it's 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 absolutely. I, I don't think it's unique in in professions. You know, one of the one of the more famous ones is you know the fire service is supposed to be this this brotherhood of of people. You know, and it absolutely is. And I don't know whether you know, but I was a, after I retired from the Coast Guard, I became a firefighter for ten years. And I would always get a lot of beef from those guys because I wouldn't, you know, like in brotherhoods just like ours. You know, you wear your swimmer. Uh, shirt or you've got a swimmer sticker on your car or yeah whatever uh you know and i didn't do that in the fire service i didn't wear firefighters t-shirts to town and i didn't uh i wasn't what part of the brotherhood you know oh, and they, would, yeah. they, they, they they would give me a hard time and i'd say look i already i already belong to a boys club and and uh you know i, I like you guys and i like this work uh but i i already have brotherhood um and and i think most of them got it you know uh, but it's, but yeah, it's absolutely, there's something unique about, about what we share, I think is, as uh, as swimmers. And I don't know why that is. Um, but it's absolutely there. Yeah, it totally is. It, it's, it's awesome. I love it. I, I, yeah. I mean, heck, I mean, look at you and I right now talking to, you know, I was rescue swimmer number 500, you were 66 and we're, you know, the stuff that you and I went through is very similar And at the same time, it's so different. And yet we can sit around a campfire and, you know, and we just keep in touch. It's what we do. It's, it's awesome. So, yeah, for sure. For sure. So now in East city, um, I'm going to ask you about your first case, but you actually mentioned to me offline saying that you don't even remember your actual first case. I I don't remember my first case. Uh, I, I, I remember a lot of what was going on around me, what the other guys were doing. Um, um, but I don't remember, I don't remember my first case, you know, so much of, I think a swimmer career is made up of what I would characterize as assists. You know, you go out on a, uh, an overdue or someone whose whose boat has run out of gas out in the swamps during duck hunting and you go out and you check and make sure he's okay. And maybe you give him a ride back to shore. And those things can kind of fall away from your, 
your memory about the things that you've done. Uh, or sometimes, you know, just when things go just right uh, and, and aren't remarkable, you know, even if you go out and pull somebody out of the, the dark and stormy, but everything goes just right. Uh, for me, those, those memories slip away too. Uh, for me, the ones that, that are, uh, and, and that don't go well are the ones that stick in my mind. And in the rescue service in general, I think there's a, a type of, of firefighter or swimmer that doesn't take it home with them. They can go out and do their job and do it right. Uh, no matter how it goes. And then they get home and they sleep well and they do it again tomorrow. And for me, I have a, a, an affliction where I can't do that. I, I, uh, I take it home with me and I lose sleep over it and I perseverate over it. And so the good fodder for that is not the things that go well, but the things that you second guess yourself and should I have this and should I have that? And if I had done this, would the outcome have been different? And those yeah. are the ones that, that are heavy and, and that, that lay on my mind and my memory. So I, I do not remember my first call for whatever reason. Um, but uh, I do, uh, there, the, the ones that stick out, there were three that came rapid fire uh, in the third year of my, my tour there that uh, I would characterize as almost ending my career because of um, kind of the tragedy involved in them. And I had some outs and some, some ways that I could overcome that and i'm glad that i did but uh they were they were a gigantic opener eye opener for me uh moving forward and uh, those are the those are the three that uh if you're interested i can i can share uh, them with you i think i can get through them fairly quickly so we're not here you know for the next nine hours although i am <laughs> am a little, a little i have been known to to run my mouth a bit so uh, um, i'm very much okay with staying here for nine hours for everybody else that's listening they're like oh god nine hours but I, man, <laughs> yeah. i'm in so hit start me out like what what happened because so this I, was between you and i i don't know these stories um you know just kind of backtrack a little bit like going through school you know we hear some of the stories that you guys had done as students from instructors and then you you know some of our debrief you're like listen this is what i've done this is why i've done it this is what you're going to learn from us you know but other yeah. than that these stories i'm excited to hear them. yeah I, I i probably i haven't short shared these with a lot of people over the years i've shared them with people that are close to me uh, because they're kind of intimate stories and it's honestly it's it, with some of them it's hard to tell without um without getting choked up without uh without having to pause for a moment and i and i although there's some there's some authenticity to, to that type of tale i don't you know it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't play well in a group to to do that so um I, I don't share these stories with a lot of people and I'm not surprised that you would not have heard of these either from me or somebody else, certainly not from somebody else. Cause they're all stories that didn't end well. And for me, they're stories that are very, very personal and private. And, um, uh, but at the same time meant uh, a great deal to my career going forward. I was only, you know, three years into a, a 20 year career uh, when these three things happened to me. So um, cool. I, I'm going to share them kind of in, in order of how I remember them happening and I'll, okay. and I'll, and I, I won't, I won't go too much into detail. I'll give you kind of the highlights of each one, but I, I think at the end, you'll, you'll get the idea of, of maybe the weight that they held on me afterwards. Uh, um, all right. it was, these all happen in the, around the summer of 1989, again, my, my third year at, at the shop in Elizabeth city. Uh, summertime, uh, we get a call. I'm on duty uh, that there's um, a boy who's gone missing. A three-year-old boy has gone missing at the James River Beach up in the Hampton Roads area. The James River is one of the, the tributaries off of the Chesapeake Bay. And there was a small beach up in James County uh, on the James River where, you know, just locals would go to. It's on a river, but, you know, the rivers in that area are more like lakes. They're big, open, flat areas. They're not like a river with rocks and current and all that stuff. And so we get a call that there's a, a, a boy who's gone missing uh, at a day at the beach. And so we get going. At the time we were flying, I was flying an H3s, uh, the Sikorsky H3 helicopter at the time, which was the last helicopter that the Coast Guard flew that could actually still land on the water. Right. Uh, and deploy swimmers from from the the helicopter while it was in the water and that's how this turned out to be we get on scene 
and it's just a summer day and there's a lot of people that were there uh, enjoying the day there's probably a hundred or so people on the beach and their towels and their coolers and their umbrellas and having a good day and suddenly there's this just this big scene and there were a lot of emergency vehicles already on scene we could see them as we approached all the lights from the police uh, and fire uh, uh, vehicles uh, and everybody's it's like it's like you're on stage and uh, I, although you know, all swimmers imagine being on stage. That's kind of, I think uh, a lot of us want this idea of, you know, being, being on the forefront. And that's part of why we're okay. Being swimmers is we want to be um, out the, on the forefront. I, I'm certainly that guy. If you put an elevated platform anywhere near me. I'm almost always on it because I want to be in front. So, um, yeah. so we get there and we, we get a brief idea. The kid's been missing for a, a about 20 to 30 minutes. So I'm already thinking that's an awful long time. And I'm hoping that he's, you know, on the beach somewhere up in the woods and they just, you know, he's, he's going to be found. But um, either way that the, the water was too shallow for me to deploy from uh, a flying position. And so they decided to land on the water. So they landed off, taxied into position and put me in the water. I was the first rescuer in the water um i could see that the fire department and their dive crew with their uh, scuba equipment and stuff were were getting suited up and getting ready to get in the water and so they put me in the water and i just started doing surface dives in the area that he went missing in and i'd been at that for about um oh i don't know about 10 minutes before the dive team from the local rescue services entered the water too and they had a system of ropes and radiuses and all i'm not I, I won't go into how they do that but it, basically they're 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 trying to search for the kid too yeah. and there's some there's something surreal about you know pretty quickly you start thinking well if, I, if i'm going to find him this way he's not going to be alive right and so that starts that starts to run through your mind so pretty pretty quickly this idea of being a hero on stage uh disappears from your mind and now you're swimming around in very murky water hoping you're going to bump into a body and i wasn't prepared for that i wasn't prepared for how that i would feel about that uh and you start thinking do i want to find him or do i not want to find him you know wow. yeah uh and so um this is what's going on i'm kind of working independently outside of the areas that they're covering this this team of say three three divers and a rope uh you know doing one person stays still and the other one swings around. Anyway, within about five minutes, I come up from one of my surface dive and I see the three of them are all together. So I know that they've found this child. So um, I go over to see if I can assist. Uh, they're uh, motioning to the beach and they've got um, one of their helpers bringing out a sheet, a white sheet. And they're probably, they're probably uh, 50, 50 feet, 100 feet offshore of the beach. And they're all kind of gathered around each other. And they can t you can tell they've got the child with them, but you can't see. And someone comes out and brings the sheet. And uh, now all you can see is the sheet in between these three divers. And suddenly there's an older gentleman on the beach, big guy. But I make up, he was, I don't know, 60, 65 years old. You could tell, I mean, like a steel worker, strong, big, still fit kind of guy. And he's trying yeah. to get into the water. And the firefighters and the police are trying to hold him back and keep him from getting in the water. And I can hear him. I can hear him saying, my son, my son, my son. And he's trying to get into the water because he knows they've found him and he will not be held back. And they let him go and he wades into the water to these three divers who have his grandson oh, in their arms man. with this white sheet over him. And it's so clean, you know, the water is dark and murky. And there are these professionals that are all cradling this small body, this three year old boy in this sheet and the, the old man gets to them and he pushes his way through and they hand him to him. And all you see is the small white arm hanging out from underneath the white sheet and his red hair. I'll never forget his red hair. Just 
beautiful cropped short red hair and it's all i ever saw of the body but just the grief and this grandfather and imagining what their day started out to be and what it ended up being and wow. i felt ashamed i felt ashamed and sad and um just everything and uh and I felt like this is this is not how I imagined a career in the Coast Guard being. This is not um, I wasn't I just absolutely was not prepared for it. No one had ever said this could happen and this is how you should deal with it. And I never even laid hands on. I'm not the one that found him. I was only witness to the drama of it. And uh, it 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 uh, I'll never forget the scene for as long as I live and. I, I don't tell this story very often because as you, as you can hear, it's hard to say. So, uh, oh, you know, I fly God, back. I, 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 I wanted to be away from it as quickly as possible. I swim back out, ready for pickup. Uh, I can't remember whether they picked me up from the water, or whether they, or I make up that they lowered the, the cable and picked me up and off we went. Um, and at that time, and I don't, I hope it's different now at that time. Uh, you know, you don't, there, there wasn't a lot of, uh, chatter about it. You get home and you know, the other swimmers will have the case go. And once they've, you know, you find out it didn't end well, you know, it's kind of, I don't want to say it swept under the rug, but there's just not a lot of discussion about it. Um, and so you move forward. Right. Um, so that, so that was, that was one of the three, that was the first one of the three that kind of came rapid fire over that summer for me. Uh, and I don't know whether you have any questions about that or whether you want me to go straight into the, the second one. Um, however you want to, however you want to attack it, Jason. Well, I, I, right now I'm, I'm just kind of in awe at the moment. I mean, okay. Wow. Well, I'll, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just keep piling it on by going into the next one, which unfortunately also has to do with a child that I, uh, strangely never, never laid eyes on at all. It was more of, um, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. So I'll just tell the story. Uh, I don't know how much longer, but not very much longer, maybe weeks. Uh, I'm on duty again. You get a call early in the morning. It's still dark that there's been a vehicle crash on the Alligator River uh, just south of Elizabeth City, probably 20 miles as the crow flies. It's across the, the Pass Twink River and the Albemarle Sound uh, on a place called the Alligator River. And it's a, a small two-lane bridge with a swing bridge section in the middle of it and early in the morning when it was dark uh, there was a family of three that was uh, driving home from the beach to somewhere inland and um, they collided with a, a, a oh, it was a dump truck or some large tractor trailer rig or something like that they were in a jeep no top on the jeep uh, mother and father in the front were seat belted in uh, the child in the back, the two-year-old child, was strapped into his car seat. The car seat was sh strapped to the seat in the back of the Jeep. But unfortunately, the back seat wasn't bolted to the bottom of the Jeep. And so when they collided, the, the, the child, its uh, child safety seat and the seat that it was strapped to were ejected out of the Jeep and into the water. Oh no. Um, and so this, un un unlike, or, or like the first case that I described very quickly, maybe immediately, you know, that there's, you're, you're not going to be, you're not going to be saving some life today. You're, you're going to be looking for a body and, um, and that has to be done. And that's part of, what I want to, what, what these stories have in common is sometimes you have to go out, you have to go out knowing that it's not going to end well, that it's going to be tragic. And there's a special kind of courage, I think, and willingness to do those, those types of things that doesn't get talked about much. And that's why one of the reasons I chose to tell these stories is that, um, that there's a value in that type of heroism and that type of courage that, that um, rescuers and all 
all venues of rescue in the world have to do have to face that and it was something i was just absolutely unprepared for um yeah. so anyway uh so I, I there's we we get on scene as the sun's coming up there's uh, the the jeep is gone but there's a black hole where it had after after the collision and the mother and father had gotten out safely with no injuries at all that the jeep had burned up and we spent a full bag of fuel uh hoping to find this this child and flew and flew and flew and flew and weren't sure you know whether this stuff would float and so we spent a lot of time looking the sh- looking at the shoreline um, they didn't put me in the water at all to do any dives that the water there were and it was right at the swing bridge the, the deepest part of the channel where the boats the intercoastal water actually goes underneath that bridge and it's fairly deep but uh, I think they didn't see a, any value in putting me in the water to do surface dives there to see if the child was in the water. So I never deployed at all. Just a long, long search. I think the H3 had maybe four or five hours in the bag to be able to search. And we searched every bit of that up past noon, went back and got a box lunch and came back out and did an, a long search. And I'll end the story by saying the only thing we ever found that day was a bag of toys that had also been ejected out of the back of the Jeep. And for me, the, the symbolism or something in that small bag of toys is what I remember the most about that day. Uh, They did find the child two days later. Um, um, But for me, just finding that bag of toys was maybe more meaningful, more powerful going forward than any of it you know and them saying look in it what's in there you know and you know what, what, what's a two-year-old boy having a little bag of toys that his parents packed up for him at the beach before they left that morning in the dark yeah you know you know a little stuffed animal a little maybe a little fire truck i don't remember exactly but but to know that those toys belonged to somebody that was no longer there anymore and they weren't going to be held in the night before they went to bed or pushed across the floor when they, when they first woke up in the morning or sat there next to their Cheerios, you know, on the table right. next to them. And, and all that was just whew, um, wow. hu- huge. And so without being deployed, <laughs> without mm-hmm. having to save, it was absolutely one of the most, one of the memories in my Coast Guard career that sticks with me um, very, very strongly. And remember, this one happened just weeks after after the James River case. Yeah, um, so you're already going out with a, a mindset of what just happened. So you're re, right. you know, recollecting over right. everything that just happened. And now you're going out right. for another child. Wow. Yeah, and, and to be completely honest with you, I wasn't I was not begging to be put out into the water to go do a surface dive for this kid. Because you're right. After what had happened at the James River, the last thing I wanted was to was to go swimming around in murky dark water, hoping I bump into a child strapped to a seat, oh, you know? So yeah. uh, I'm, I, I'm, 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 I'm ashamed to, to say that, but I was not, uh, I, I was not arguing to be, please put me in the water so I can see if I can find this. I didn't, I didn't want to do it. Um, and that I have guilt about that and I have shame about that, but that's, that's the honest truth of it. You know, I, I appreciate that honesty. Um, there are, you know, I, I look back at some of my cases and it's kind of similar scenario. Like, did I do everything I could have done? Um, this is, I, I mean, you know, yeah. What, especially when you're going out and you know, you're not, you're looking for the body versus looking for the survivor is how much do you want to put yourself out there to do that? And it is closure for the family, but I'm with you. That's, that's, uh, Wow. Yeah. Holy yeah. Shit. And you, you say it absolutely right. You know, you, I, I make up there, you have experiences that are similar to that. And I make up that throughout, not just the Coast Guard swimmer raid and job, but through all rescue, uh, there are, there are rescuers that, I mean, think about nine 11 or some of these, some of these really high profile type scenes, you know, it, it is, it is not glamorous. It's not glorious right. to go looking to go looking for dead folks. Um, yeah. 
but it's got to be it's got to be done. It's it, there has to be an effort to to maybe miraculously save somebody, but more often than not, just give closure to a family or closure to the scene and not have people wonder forever and to have some some tangible um, product. It's a horrible word to use, but uh, something at the end to say, okay, okay, this 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 chapter is closed and we yes. can go on. And it's, it, it, it's a, I make up, it's a very common experience that doesn't get talked about very much because it's hard, hard, hard to talk about. Yeah. Um, but, but I think for me, absolutely necessary um, to wow. not, to not hang on to those things and bury them. So if you want, I can go on to the third story. It's, it's uh, unlike the other two and that it doesn't involve a child. Thank goodness. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and there is an element in this last one of, of loss of, of, uh, cause it wasn't, we did not go out expecting to find tragedy. I expected to save a life that day. Okay. Um, and so I'll tell this last one. And again, I don't remember exactly, but I, I feel like it was only weeks until this third and last one in this, this trilogy of tragedy. I, that's a great <laughs> trilogy. I didn't make that up. I didn't work on that trilogy of tragedy. <laughs> it just just came to me right now. You know what? Um, it was really good. So, I might actually like. Uh, I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, so uh, same summer, 1989, uh, on duty again. Get a call that um, a commercial fishing boat off of the Outer Banks, somewhere off the of Hatteras. Uh, doing, I guess, drift, drift net fishing. Um, the guy had gotten pulled through a winch. Now, I don't know if you've talked to Al Yates or not yet. I have and, actually just talked to Al Yates and um, d- yeah, he's going to be, all right. So his podcast is, was just aired not too long ago. Yeah. He has a, he has a famous story that most of us know a, a, sort of the, the same situation where, uh, a, a cable driven drum that pulls a net aboard um, grabs hold of one of the fishermen and pulls it into the winch or pulls it into the drum. Um, and um, you know, it can happen in all kinds of ways where there's a you know piece of the cable that's coming undone. And it's a little hook fish hook and it grabs a, a sleeve of your coat. And next thing you know, you're being wound up in a, in a big heavy cable, to drum set up and um, Al's ended one way and mine ended up a different way, but we get out, uh, they, they've extracted this fisherman who's, I don't know how many turns he took around the drum before they stopped and reversed it and got him out. But we know we're headed out to, uh, it's a medevac. Uh, he's been pulled through the winch. He's got internal injuries. Uh, he's got uh, some bruising and uh, signs of you know damage, but he is alive and they've got him below decks and they're attending to him and he's okay. walking talking you know i'm i'm feeling feeling optimistic that we're gonna we're gonna get this guy and we're gonna get him to the hospital and they're gonna save his life so pretty long flight i'd say it's about 45 minute flight out to where he was and again we're in the h3 we brought along a flight corpsman i don't know if they're still flying with with corpsman or not whether corpsman can get qualified as flight flight medics but we had one on board that day and i don't remember what his name was i can remember what he looked like but i don't know who he was and um, part of that will, why that may might become clear at the end of the story. But so it's me and the flight corpsman on the back and we're, you know, we're talking to the boat as we get closer and they're saying he's conscious, uh, that he, uh, he hurts a lot and he, he seems to have some, some blood in his mouth, um, but that he's alive and, and talking. And so this is what we're expecting. And right up till we get there, they are saying that he's uncomfortable. He doesn't want to be laid down that he, he, he wants to sit up. Okay. And so we get on scene um, as a crew, we decide we're going to, uh, because we don't know what, uh, what other types of injuries we have, you know, that kind of, that kind of mechanism could cause all kinds of uh, back and, and, you know, neck pain or neck problems, spinal stuff. So we decide we're going to lift him by, by um, litter. Um, And so uh, just as we get on scene, the boat crew from I'm not sure where they came out of probably Oregon Inlet uh, just arrived on scene the same time we did. And so uh, it looks like I'm not even going to, cause they've got a, a, a EMT on board. So that doesn't look like I'm going to get down to package this guy up and put him in the litter and get him down that the boat crew can do that. And that's what they decide. 
So the, the boat crew gets on board and their EMTB uh, and their crew begin to package this guy for hoist in the litter. Okay. And we're watching this from above and they get the guy up on deck and you can see he's, he's walking up on deck. They lay him down in the litter and I turn around to get all my gear ready, you know, to treat him with a flight, with a flight medic when we get him and the f- f- flight mech starts, uh, you know, trying to get my attention and he points down below where I can't see and he's making the CPR sign. He's, he's something and blowing. Holy uh, smoke. Through, through sign language. And I shake my head like, no, 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 he's alive. He's like, no, they're thumping and blowing. He was so just I walking poke my head out. Like out of the, he was just, oh he my just gosh. walked out. He just walked out from down below decks. I saw him walking. I turned around to get my stuff ready to receive and to start taking care of him. And now they're doing CPR on this guy. And, you know, talk about, uh, you know, a, a U-turn. And so we have to start getting things ready in a different way. It seems like forever for them to, to get this guy. Cause now I'm thinking, okay, he, he only just coded. And so we've still got a good chance of, of helping this guy. Yeah. And it seems like it's taken forever f- to get this guy in the litter and get him up. But it, it, it was probably a, a very quick hoist and we'd get him on board. And uh, sure enough, he's, he's not breathing uh, and he's and his heart stopped. And so we began CPR, uh, me and this, this flight medic. And while well, we head for home and it's going to be about a 45 minute flight to Armour hospital in, in Pasquin County where we're taking them. And I know it's going to be a long flight. Yeah. And, and so we, uh, you know, we're, uh, the, I'm sure the flight corpsman had advanced skills, probably paramedic types, IV drugs, those kinds of things, but it starts out just like any two EMTBs might handle something like that. You're just, you're going to take turns. Somebody's going to be doing compressions and somebody's going to be doing ventilations. And that's how it starts out. Uh, we really quickly uh, changed from manual ventilations, which was still being done back in those days with a pocket mask uh, to a positive pressure ventilator. So using oxygen bottles to do the ventilation by just holding the mask on their face and pushing a button. Right. And uh, we are uh, in Mustang suits because the water, the combination of water and air temp is still at that level where we were flying in, um, flight Mustangs, which were like snowmobile suits. And I don't know whether you ever wore anything like it, but in the summertime in a Mustang suit, uh, it's miserable just sitting there having your lunch, let alone doing the physical effort of doing CPR. Uh, yeah. Working on a victim or working on a patient. Yeah. Cause yeah, you, you're yeah. right. You're literally in a, uh, the best example you just said is a snowmobile suit. You were all kitted up, ready to go like snowmobiling, snow skiing, snowshoeing. And yeah, but, fly, it's, but it's it's beautiful outside. 80, yeah, it's 85, 90 degrees yeah. outside, and it's even hotter than that in the belly of a helicopter. Oh um, man! Even with the windows open, and so we're working, and it becomes clear very quickly that uh, I'm I'm more prepared for the physicality of the chest compressions than the vent than than this flight corpsman is, and so yeah. I'm getting the lion's share of the time doing chest compressions, and we didn't have like they've got all kinds of neat gadgets nowadays they, they used to call them thumpers or automatic chest compression devices it was all up to us for 45 minutes to do chest compressions on this guy and very quickly and i don't i don't want to get too graphic about the scene but you can imagine someone who's has major internal injuries and when you start uh doing chest compressions on them if they've got any bullet breathing that's entering their lungs or bleeding that's entering their lungs it, it's got to go somewhere and it and, and it became it started to come out of his mouth. Obviously it's now it's in his mo- nose very, very quickly. And, um, and so it's, it's a, it's a gory, awful scene. Uh, oh, and he was, he was kind of, he was kind of a heavier guy. And so it's tough to get a good seal on the mask. And so even when you're doing, uh, but when we were doing manual ventilations before we got the, the positive pressure mask out, every time you blow, you're, you're blowing this, this blood and fluid, out the side and it's all over the deck and it's all over him. And now everything's getting slippery and it's on your hands. It's, it's just, it's just this, this horrific scene. And even when we got the positive pressure mask going and now you push that button and it's like an explosion of blood every time you push that darn thing. Oh gosh. 
and, and we're going through, as you imagine, a 45 minute flight. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we, we went through two or three bottles doing this and, uh, it's just, it's the most, I, I, I like a scene from a movie. It's just, just horrible. And, and so we get to, we finally get to the, the hospital and, you know, if you've done medevacs, you know, the scene, the uh, emergency room crew comes out pushing a gurney and, and right. you, you take what you've got and you put it on in the gurney and you give a quick pass down. And we do that. Uh, we get this guy onto their gurney. I give him a quick pass down. And as soon as they walk away with him or push him away from underneath the, the turning blades, of the helicopter, I collapsed to my knees. Wow. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, maybe as tired as I've ever been in my life. And I'm on my knees and I, I unzip my, um, my, my flight suit, my, this Mustang, this flight Mustang, this Nomex snowmobile suit down to my belly. And I'm just dripping, soaking wet. And, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm covered in blood, my hands and my legs and my boots are just covered and you know they're trying to get me back on the helicopter to get back to the house i'm able to do that we get back to the house they shut down and now i know i've got this cleanup to do it so my job our job as swimmers to uh you know to do a post flight right. and for us while everybody else is doing the post flight in the airframe and the engine and all that stuff we're we have to post flight our gear we have to post flight the cabin and get that clean and all the, the stuff that that entails. And so there's this st still this job to do, you know, the guy's dead. Things are a mess. I'm, I'm exhausted beyond belief and I've still got to do this other part of my job, not to mention the paperwork. Right. 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 And, and every, everybody wants to help. And I'm mad as I'm madder than a hatter. And I don't know why, but I'm, I'm just, I'm angry. I'm angry because of how it went. I'm angry because uh, I've got to still do this horrible work of cleaning up. I'm angry at the flight corpsman for not having done any of the advanced stuff that I knew he was capable of. Um, and, and, and questions running through my mind about why that was. I'm angry because I had to do the lion's share of the, the compressions and he sat there and did the rest. You know, I, I'm, I'm just mad. And every time somebody wants to know, can, can I help you get, no, I got it. And so I'm like a, this martyr for the next two hours cleaning up this, this horrific mess. Yeah. And uh, at the end of it, four o'clock comes around and the duty's over and now I get to drive home. But before I've got to clean myself up and I look in the mirror upstairs in the shower room and I had put my visor down pretty quickly on my helmet during this, this rescue and so that it wasn't getting in my eyes. And I had this perfect outline across my face where there was no blood underneath where the visor was and completely covered in this brown mess from my nose and my cheeks down to my neck. And I hadn't seen myself in a mirror in that whole two hours of cleaning up. And I imagined what I must have looked like to those people that were trying to help me. Yeah clean up you know they just wanted me to go they just wanted me to go get showered up and get it off myself and i was being an asshole to everybody because i saw it as my job to do and i was so mad but i get cleaned up and i'm driving home in my brand new toyota mr2 that i with the t-top off that i thought i was mr shit hot swimmer with stickers all over it that said who I was, Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer, you know, and I'm driving home and I fucking hit a dog. <laughs> oh, God. R runs across the highway and I hit this dog on my way home after a fucking day like that. And uh, I decided right then I was done. That I, I didn't sign up for that shit and that summer and that that filth and that tragedy and the anger and the it didn't it did, it's not no one told me being a rescue consumer is going to be like that and decided I was done I was going to quit just three years into my career and so uh, 
long story short, I went through the process of telling people that needed to know that I wanted to do that. And then of course, everybody's, you're a valuable asset. They really want you to quit and they want to, you know, talk you out of it and stuff. And we came upon this plan for me to go to the E2C program for a while. The, the war on drugs was just getting hot. A lot of money was being poured into that. And the Coast Guard started flying Navy E2Cs down in the Caribbean looking for druggies. And they were getting ready to move from Norfolk, Virginia, where they were learning how to fly that aircraft, uh, moving down to St. Augustine, Florida, and plussing up a station and flying those things out of uh, the Caribbean for uh, for a while, seeing if they couldn't do some good in the war on drugs. And uh, I saw that as a good way to take a break from it uh, and see if uh, I could pull myself together and continue to to be an asset as a rescue swimmer. And, uh, that's what I did, uh, within just a few months, I got had orders to E2C program. So I, I short toured in Elizabeth city for my last tour, skipped it, went and started, uh, helped them move the program, the E2 program from Norfolk to Florida and spent the new two, year, two years, next two years in the Caribbean flying in some really, really great places, but not being a rescue swimmer. And it wasn't long at all. I'd say five or six months until I had changed my mind and I missed the brotherhood. I missed flying. I missed the excitement and the possibilities of being a rescue swimmer. And so I was able to, after that two year tour, when they closed us down in St. Augustine to go back to the rate. Um, but I definitely returned to the rate with a different perspective about what it was all about. And I didn't, uh, I didn't blow my horn so much about, about how awesome rescue swimmers were. And I didn't wear shirts with patches all over them advertising who I was um, and I just went about my business more like Larry Farmer asked us to do very early on he, he said I don't know if you've ever seen the picture of that group of us black and white picture of us standing in front of an H3 with cowboy hats on he had sent a memo he, 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 he had sent a memo out pretty early on he said like, I don't I don't need a bunch of cowboys out there I need white professionals and we all laughed about it and did pictures and it was a big joke but um, I got it I got it at that point. Um, I wasn't a cowboy and I didn't want to be a cowboy. Holy shit. And that was Mike. my three. <laughs> so that's, those are my three stories. Um, and that's, that's what I got. And I, you know, I'm happy to answer questions or comment on what they mean or whatever, whatever you want, Jason. Mike, I, first, let me just tell you, I thank you for sharing. That is incredible. Well, thanks for letting me tell, tell the story. Um, there, uh, I make up, but I, I am not unique in this way in that a lot of swimmers have times like this and a lot of rescuers have times like this. And, um, uh, you know, early in the early days of our rate, and certainly for many, many years and all rescue services, fire service in general, you know, yeah. uh, we were supposed to be badasses and we're supposed to be tough guys. And there wasn't a lot of room for, for, uh, for showing weakness and for showing, uh, that you were affected in those kinds of ways. And I think that, uh, it's not healthy for the people that live those stories and it's not healthy for the professions for there to be an environment of that there ought to be an environment of, of, of being able to talk about those things without fear of being seen in a different way. And I know I've spent my, certainly after that, spent my, my time in locker rooms after tough cases, listening to guys tell their stories. Yeah. Um, you know, it's to, to tell it to people that don't know, we talk about the brotherhood. It's most valuable to tell your stories to people who have the common experience of that, that that world that profession and i've sat i sat and listened out of you know tristan heaton and the story about the cave rescue that he right. did yeah uh, I, I was i was on the second helicopter that went out after they they took him to the hospital with his people um and when i got back and we picked up tristan from the hospital and took him back you know we sat in the locker room there in astoria in, in silence for a long long time until he told me his story you know, only hours from having done it. And I, yeah. I, not like I get, I didn't give him great wisdom. I just sat with him and listened to him tell it. And so there's a value in it that I, 
I really appreciate. And I appreciate you giving me that, um, that opportunity to tell these stories again. I can't thank you enough for sharing them. I wish I could have a beer with you right now just to, to kick one back. Um, wow, Mike. One of the ways that my life and my, my outlook on that profession changed is that I would, I, I admit that I would feel a little irritated and a little, like it was my job to educate these kids. This is not, this is not all fun and games. This is not uh, get your name in the paper and, and have your friends and family clap you on the back and say, wow, you're a great guy. And so don't make my job out to be something as trivial as that. Yeah. What, what we have to do here and what, what I was preparing guys to do or to do a very serious job, a very hard job, a, a job that, required a maturity and a thoughtfulness and a willingness to do the hard work too, to do the dirty work, to do the things that you come back with and have nightmares about, or we'll, 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 we'll have flashbacks about for the rest of your life. And yeah. those types of people don't include kids that are running around thinking they're getting ready to be superstars. Right. And so if I ever made some of the stuff that pissed me off most is when those students would walk around the school pretending to already be there, AD or A, and you know, have an old, their own special place to sit and have lunch at the galley. They would already start acting like a superstar is walking around that A school. And God, that would make me so mad, <laughs> you know? Yeah. You yeah. know, you're, yeah, they're not even out there yet, and they're acting, they're acting like superstars and cowboys. That was, actually, and I get it. You know, yeah, they, they, I, yeah. people will say, people will say, you know, you need to be cocky to do that kind of work, and you do. You need a certain amount of confidence and cockiness to do some of the stuff that you're asked to do as a rescue swimmer. But you also need humanity, and you need humility, and you need the kind of courage that's not about acting. Right. And, and, and being a superstar, it's the kind of courage that takes from coming back and cleaning up the mess when it's all done. Right. Yeah. And answering the hard questions, you know? Right. Right. I mean, you, you know, I kind of pairing it all together, you went from, uh, you know, a really tough case to then another tough case to then another tough case, you know, um, your two year break. I, I, I think my only question is what advice could you give people to bring them back, to come back from all that? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I know I had it really darn good. I mean, we, we had it tough there too. We, we lost a crew uh, flying in Rosie roads late one night. We lost an E2 and, and lost uh, four shipmates in that, that, that crash. And so that kind of work was not without its tragedy as well that hit very close to home with our, within our Coast Guard community. But largely that tour was about spending time on the beach and what better way to recover than, you know, flying down to Curacao and spending time on a resort beach, you know, going out into the jungle in the middle of the night to turn a plane around and flying back out again. And so the environment was great. St. Augustine was a great place. Um, but I think sometimes you just, don't make up your mind too fast that you're done. You know, just talking about these things helps to clear them and it helps to, to, to come back to them and to, to, to move forward, whether that's staying in that profession and doing it again, or, or moving forward and doing something else. I think, I think I, the, 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 what the message is, is to don't keep it inside, to share it okay. as many times. And as with many people that you feel safe doing that with. Well, I appreciate you sharing it with me right now because you're going to help a lot of people that go through this. And there are a lot of people out there that don't understand the other side that we do. And you have definitely highlighted that today and I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for, uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity. Absolutely. Man, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on here, Mike, and, and sharing this 
um, you know, you've always been an inspiration to me personally, you know, from a school on, you know, just the, your instruction and the drive and, you know, and I say that with everybody that I went through a school with all my instructors, but, um, you know, there are things that I definitely remember from you and I appreciate what you passed on to us for, for sure. Cool. So great. Thanks, awesome. Jason. Absolutely. Well, with that, um, I, I'm going to let you go and, and say thank you again. So you're the man, right. dude. <laughs> no, no, I'm just one of the men, Jason. Just yeah. one of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, with that, right. ladies and gentlemen, we are out of here. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Real Rescue Podcast. Please take a minute and like my daughters like to tell me, like and subscribe. Oh yeah. I'm pulling chocks and taking off. But before I go, if anyone out there has a rescue story that they would be willing to share, I would be humbled and honored to have you as a guest. Or if you have any questions about any of the rescues or anything else that we talk about here on this podcast, send me an email, therealrescue at gmail.com. That's T-H-E-R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q at gmail.com. You can also check us out on our Facebook and Instagram page at The Real Rescue. That's at T-H-E-R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q. I also want to give a special thank you to all of you standing on the watch today. Always remember that when that SAR alarm goes off, those in distress are praying for a miracle. They are going to get you. Until next time, fly safe and swim hard.